polemic topic of the day, did women wear underpants in the Middle Ages? Well, the answer might surprise you depending on your stance on the question. Stay tuned for a fascinating exploration of some evidence for women having worn them. On our last thrilling episode, we explored some exciting or maybe frustrating evidence for women covering their loins and discussed the potentially problematic nature of the visual record. So, if the visual record may be suspect in either direction, what's left? Thankfully, documentary evidence of medieval women owning, inheriting, and even wearing braids does exist. For the purposes of this video essay, which is rapidly working its way towards a doctoral dissertation, we will be discussing actually five primary textual sources, some more disturbing than others. Rape cases from France, household account books who got paid to do what, wills from Italian city-states, and Italian inventories. This is just what I found thus far through only semi-serious searching. If anyone wants to fund me doing this full time and really taking a deep plunge, let me know in the comments. In the meanwhile, I do expect more evidence to turn up as my search continues into other regions of Europe and as more information gets digitized. So let us turn our attention to criminal records. Trigger warning. The next section will cite matter of effect counts of sexual assault. So please skip to the next chapter or section if you wish to issue exposure to such content. First up is a rape case that was brought before the magistrate of Saint Martin du Champ in the 14th century. Quote, on that day, Jean-Nan Ogne, tailor of gowns, staying at the corner of Rue Garnier and Saint-Ladre, in the town home of Henri Ogne, forced said Perret, the plaintiff, to enter a cellar against her will, and by force, and threw her to the ground, and took off his her braise, and put her under him, and forced himself against her nature in the manner he could. Now, this Middle French is somewhat ambiguous. I've talked to two different specialists in the language, and one says that the French could be referring to the rapist removing his victim's prey, or to removing his own, but more likely his own. While the other specialist feels it clearly refers to his victim's praise. Like all Romance languages, French possessive pronouns do not reflect the gender of the subject, but rather the object. So the word ça could be either his or her. I therefore leave it to you to decide. But the next piece of documentary evidence comes from a satirical romance from the 13th century, the Roman du Renard. It's an anthropomorphic twist on courtly adventures. The protagonist, more of a dastardly anti-hero really, engages in all sorts of mischief, some of it rather horrifying. In one of the tales, he rapes the wife of his enemy and is brought before the king to stand trial. He defends himself in the usually repulsive manner, saying, I cannot hide the fact that I loved his wife, but since she never complained and I did not pull off her trues, nor break into her house, nor break down her door, if I was dear to her and she loved me, what is this jealous fool claiming? The jealous fool in question, by the way, is her enraged husband. Of course, he's most assuredly not suffering from a jealous fit of rage, but rather righteous wrath. But I digress. This very clearly indicates that part of being raped includes having a woman's trues forcibly removed. And I've encountered several other real world medieval French cases where this was specifically mentioned as proof of the woman's victimhood, torn in bloody clothing along with physical injuries. I have a feeling that a closer scouring of literature from the Middle Ages might reveal more such passages. And as documents become increasingly digitized, such evidence might come to light sooner rather than later. So let us turn our attention to an uplifting source of evidence for a wide variety of clothing, last wills and testaments. Well, at least it's happier than rape cases, eh? For instance, one will from 1368 in Italy features some really interesting tidbits. It has a listing for a shirt and three pair of new mudande, trues in English, and then two line items below it lists, quote, item, seven old shirts and nine pairs of trues, and the sleeveless fustano da femmina. Now, the phrasing of this could imply that everything in the line item involves women's garments, which would make more sense than piling together on a somewhat random grouping of clothing into one line item, especially when almost exactly the same sort of items have already been mentioned two lines above. I think the distinction is very much meant to be male versus female, with male listed above and female itemized below. Okay, if you're enjoying this video, then please take a moment to like and subscribe and hit the bell and even maybe consider becoming a patron on Patreon to support such content going forward. Comes with perks such as discounts on my classes and workshops. Okay, enough shameless plugging, back to your program. 
Another will from Italy in 1367 makes specific mention of mudande dieci da omo, men's trues, ten pairs. Why would they waste precious vellum and ink specifying the gender of the trues if only men wore them as a general rule? If there are men's trues, that implies that there must be women's as well as a common occurrence, at least common enough to have to specify male versus female. On an interesting note, one inventory of items belonging to Lucio Contanto a Moise, taken in Italy in 1348, features a pair of trues lined in cotton batting. Because this was an inventory of her belongings, one might assume that the clerk felt no need to specify the default gender of the garments because, well, it was a woman's inventory. So, in fact, no men's garments are mentioned at all in her will. Now, these could be a pair of trues intended for a woman's menses, or one can argue that they're for incontinence and therefore not reflective of what a healthy young woman might have worn on a regular basis. Fair enough. Much to your probable annoyance, I therefore leave it to you to decide. Is this evidence of women having worn underwear as a regular course of action or not? But fear not, more concrete evidence is at hand. For instance, I found one will from Venice dating to 1300 in which a priest leaves his bre to his niece, his mudande, which might not only be an indication that women wore such garments as a matter of course, but that in 1300 they were not necessarily terribly different from the version worn by men in that same place and time. Might also be an indication that pre mudande were a bit of a luxury item in certain social classes of that era, because otherwise why would you bequeath them onward to your heirs? For the ultimate in clarity about women wearing underwear in this era, documents such as dowries and trousseau registries can provide some fascinating details. And once I discovered further Latin terminology, suddenly I had a surfeit of evidence of women in Italian city-states owning underpants. The respective word here is interlula, or interulis, or intercula, and the other declensions of that word, depending on your grammatical structure. Anyway, in 1400, for instance, in Venice, one Aviano Nicolosio di Domenico registered the dowry he'd received for his son's wife. The entry in the archives details every single item of her biancheria, her linen undergarments. And this one specifies that she had tres interculas novas e veteres, three pairs of trues, new and old. As the new bride was a young woman, it is highly unlikely that these garments were intended to address the incontinence of old age, making this proof of young, healthy women wearing underpants in the Middle Ages, at least in a specific time and place thereof. Further searches using the term interulas or interculas have resulted in additional unambiguous evidence, specifically in the Italies. For instance, the trousseau of Antonio Gacitano, registered in 1476, features interulas tres muliebres, three pairs of women's underwear. I feel that's pretty unambiguous, as much as that statement might not be crucified in the comments. The upside is which that all engagement is good engagement on YouTube. What a world we live in. When it comes to revealing the otherwise unrevealable about clothing, guild statutes represent another titillating glimpse into the past. The ordinances of the guilds of Paris from 1350 specifically state that, quote, tailors making male robe linge in the common fashion should be paid air denier. Some fashion historians interpret the term robe linge as being a synonym for bray, and if there's a male version specifically mentioned, then that must imply that there is a female version, of course. In that same line item, they mention a woman's shirt for four derniers, so robe linge might just be a synonym for shirt in this case. But interesting that a woman's costs so much less when normally a woman's shirt should actually contain more fabric than a man's shirt and require therefore more effort. So aside from engaging in exciting activities such as will trawling, I've also been pouring through rollicking action adventures such as medieval dictionaries, and I've made a very interesting discovery in the Catholicon published in 1380. This work defines the word feminale as meaning bre du femme, and the word femorale as brea homme, which would seem to imply that women must have worn them pretty commonly if female bre had their own term in Latin, one that was given its own entry in an expensive medieval dictionary from the late 14th century. Laws can also reveal a great deal about society's practices in general. In terms of women in trues, certain polities had sumptuary regulations requiring the unholy trinity of medieval immorality, that being prostitutes, actresses, and acrobats, to wear underpants. 
Some people have interpreted such rules as indicating that only marginal and socially unacceptable women wore underwear as a sign of their sinfulness. But is that the only interpretation or even necessarily a valid one? Requiring these women to wear underwear certainly cannot have been for the same reason as other sumptuary laws, which were intended to visibly demarcate these dishonorable women from the good damsels and matrons of the community. Not even prostitutes walked around with their bray showing. In fact, Prostitutes were often required to wear more clothing, bundling themselves up in voluminous mantles and hoods. There must therefore have been another reason why communities felt the need to legislate the wearing of undergarments for these particular groups of women. As far as many medieval communities were concerned, there was practically no distinction between these classes of women, and it was said that actresses and acrobats were just a type of prostitute with a greater range of professional offerings, shall we say. I actually believe this legislation indicates that these classes of women were likely to not wear underpants because of the nature of their work. And pardon me as I speak somewhat indelicately here. Not having Bray in the way would facilitate their professional tasks by making the relevant parts more accessible to their clientele, speaking about prostitutes specifically. By requiring prostitutes to wear Bray, the various polities could have well been limiting the occasion for them to provide services, making it harder to render sexual services on a street, for instance, and requiring service provider and client to retreat to a more secluded area and remove certain key items, shall we say. This may have been an attempt to make prostitution less convenient and therefore less desirable as either a career field or a product. Now, I'm completely conjecturing on this score, mind you. My research is ongoing. As for requiring female acrobats to wear underwear, I think that's fairly obviously intended to ensure that the relative bits were covered during performances, which to my mind is an indication that covered female genitalia were the more modest and desired outcome rather than the idea that underpants were salacious. It could well be though that as the centuries passed, the wearing of underpants in women came to be associated with prostitutes and performers because of these modesty laws and retroactively developed the reputation of being a salacious garment, perhaps leading to the dying out of the custom amongst so-called respectable women in certain regions, if indeed the custom did truly die out. Now that being said, if you actually have to pass a law that requires an acrobat to wear underpants, a female acrobat to wear underpants, that could mean that women weren't typically wearing them and so they had to specify that in this case the women must. So, you know, again, open to interpretation. And even the lack of documentary evidence in some regions can be easily explained by the fact that across medieval Europe, the ladies of the house were often in charge of making their own underthings, and often even those of their male relatives, which means that they did not have to order them from outside craftsmen. This practice applied even at the upper echelons of society. For instance, Alessandra Strozzi writes to her sons frequently in their exile in Rome and talks about making them undershirts. So this means that documents such as account books would lack entries for female bre, but still have them for men, especially men who did not have women folk to make their garments for them, or whose women folk had more important things to do than make all the underpants for both themselves and their men folk. No dainty women folk idling away in towers in this actual period of history, no matter what the Victorians might wanted you to believe. Right, enough dusty books. Let us move on to the practical observations from years of medieval living history, both going commando and wearing and using 15th century style braids. Trigger warning. This may get a little graphic in the discussion of female anatomy, but nothing that would violate community standards. So you've been warned. I've been falling down the rabbit hole of medieval recreation for nearly 27 years, starting as a very freshly minted teenager in a proto-internet era in which the web consisted of nothing but porn and chat rooms. There was almost no useful information available on the internet back then, and in fact not much useful that had even been published or that was accessible at any rate in my rural little southern Delaware hometown. And yet, conventional wisdom at that time said that women in the Middle Ages did not wear underpants nor did I question the convention, assuming the matter as settled. And so, I spent nearly the first 17 years of my reenactment life under that paradigm, living for weeks at a time in medieval encampments, wearing layers of gowns that dragged on the ground, walking miles and miles a day, dancing all night, sweating up a storm. And by the end of the evening, not only were my legs so repulsive from all the cake dust, even at completely indoor sites with nicely paved floors, that I had to bathe before climbing into bed or disgust myself into insomnia. 
you would be amazed at how efficiently 15th century gowns vacuum up all the fine particulate matter into the vacuum bag that seems to form around one's legs. And not just my legs, the juncture of my legs was always crusted with sweat, dirt, creating an absolutely awful combination. And so, a pre-bed basin bath happened every single night without fail at such events. And then, the Langberg finds were published and word went out that there was a pair of Bray among them that could possibly be female. And so, I hastened to manufacture a pair based on the originals. Not a perfect reproduction in terms of dimensions and ratios, I adjusted them to fit me and my body more comfortably. But they still fit with the visual representations of the style of trues that I could find. And lo, even though my legs were still rather dirty at the end of any given day of medievalist activity, my nether legions were perfectly lovely. Okay, well maybe not lovely, but you get the gist. What a massive improvement in hygiene. In terms of the practicality of wearing these underpants under three to four layers of dresses, I experienced no more difficulties than not wearing the braid. Utilizing the latrine was no more or less complicated, really. Honestly, managing all the various folds of fabric, the two meters of train, the henin, the veil, all more complicated than removing, settling, and putting back on braid. Simply undo the one side, and in the original Langberg pair, it indeed seems that there are only ties on the one side, and let the other side hang on my thigh. Then, when I stand up, I just tie the other side back on, no struggle at all, and only slightly more work than wearing no panties at all, which I also did for many years, remember. But with my level of high-paced activity, the difference in hygienic outcomes is immense. And when it is that time of the month, the braille help protect my undergarments and serve as a fine support for clients. I've actually heard some reenactors and fashion historians claim that women just bled out into their smocks, and that this was the purpose of the smock. I think not on so many levels, aside from that being disgusting. I mean, just physically would feel awful. So I'm not going to just bleed freely into my nice white smock and let those stains do what they will. Uh-uh, not happening. Well, there you have it. And that's not even all of the supporting evidence I've uncovered. And will no doubt continue to uncover as time goes on in the, and as I continue to plunge down rabbit holes. So where do you stand on the debate? Let me know in the comments. Otherwise, stay creative and stay tuned for your moment of non-underpants related kitty zen. Okay, the cat the cat did go back to sleep with Eli. We're just going to leave them there and see how long they stay like that. <laughs>